Sure, well, um, thanks Commissioner Captown and the rest of uh, the commissioners and uh, Robert. Um, what I did for this rotational meeting is I wanted to, I thought we would, or I would put it to, put everything together in a PowerPoint um, and present it to you that way. So I think we'll just, we'll just start off here. We want to make sure it always seems like we're out of time when we do ours. So we'll just jump right into it here. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to go over um, is a quick breakdown of our, of our staff. I think most of you are kind of aware somewhat of what our staff looks like as far as the different divisions and how much we have in each division there. Um, the next, next I, wanted I wanted to jump into hiring. So currently we're down 26 people. So if you look at at uh, that chart there, it says team one, team two, three, four, five, admin and book, admin assistant and booking clerk. So those are the spots in the jail that we currently have open. And the reason that it says teams like that is that just shows like which each team, how many people they're missing or have open spots on their team. And then of course we've got um, six roster positions that are open, open right, right now, now in the jail. jail. And then and six, six patrol, patrol openings. openings. And so, so as, as everyone in here understands, understands typically how we have conducted, conducted business in the past, past is when our jail, jail was, was more fully, fully staffed, staffed, so to so speak, speak, we were pulling our patrol positions out of the jail to, to fill um, to fill those patrol spots. And now that we're at a position in the jail where we can't really take anyone else from the jail, we that's how we ended up with the six patrol openings because we've just been kind of trying to hold off <clears> to let our jail catch up so we could take out but we realized that that's not really conducive anymore we can't really do that and keep holding on for or uh or anticipating that those jail spots were going to fill up so we could take out there so we started opening up those patrol openings to the outside directly that's that's got to be frustrating for some of your jail um individuals who are looking forward to get out of the patrol and now they're seeing it pass them by yep I mean, so it's got to create some morale issues so, so here's what we did. Um, that's an excellent question. So here's what we did. You're, you're very much right in the fact that people that are working in there, they put in several years of time to and hope that they would get out on patrol. And uh, it, it can cause morale issues if we don't take from there. So what we decided to do was take, you know, I went out and I personally met with everyone and just said, hey, here's why we can't take all six from the jail, because we're, we're, we're too short staffed. And if, um, I was to come and take six additional people out of the jail right now, we would have to go to an emergency type schedule in the jail, and people don't really want to do that. In fact, majority of the jail staff that are not licensed who can't come out and do patrol, they prefer that we don't that I don't take anyone from the jail. Um, and if we do take anyone from the jail, we're gonna have to wait till May or June um, until we can get hopefully get back up to capacity where we can take out of there. And I can't. And we're, we'll get to this as we go farther down, but I can't, um, you know, we've got some, with these six patrol openings that we have, I've got some of our task force that don't have people from the sheriff's office on there. And we don't have people on task force from the sheriff's office. That makes it hard for the task force to operate because as the sheriff's office, we have jurisdiction over Bull County. And if we're on the task force, then those people from other agencies can go all over in the county and work with us. So if we don't have, if we're not there, we don't really have that liaison to that. So, um, but what we did do is we took our first person from. So we have we had uh, an initial hiring um, people that we had put together that we've taken four people from right now, and one of those individuals was from the jail. We just told him that he can't come out until probably May or June. So we're trying to we're taking one here and there to just let people know that we're still going to do. All right, here's our calls for service. So if you look at our calls for service, we're definitely, uh, we've definitely jumped up. So from 2018, 18,355, 2019, 17,230, 2020, 22, 617, and 2021, up through today's date, 30,232. If you look at that graph on the side, you can see that Fargo PD is the highest. They have 98,000 calls for service. And then right after that, it's Moorhead Police Department at 34,000 calls for service. 
And then we're third of all the agencies in this area. We're third for calls for service. We're higher than West Fargo PD by about 4,000. Um, and so it just kind of shows you how busy our agency really is. And that's not even including, that's just calls for service. So calls for service would be someone who calls in the dispatch and wants an officer to respond to the residents to take a report. It could be taking a crash report. It could be a generated calls for service from our guys where they do a traffic stop and arrest someone uh, for a drug charge. Then a calls for service gets generated. Um, but those calls for service don't even reflect our seven to 10,000 given the year bookings that we have a year, which is, we don't, we don't include those as a calls for service, but we were to throw that on top of here. So Jesse, yes. you, um, you show how much it's gonna total each year. Is there one of those areas, those six breakdowns that have gone up more than others? For example, you know, City of Fargo or West Fargo? Is, have they also gone up? Is that kind of what you're asking? Well, I mean, of those six, have they all uniformly gone up from 2018 to 2021? Or is there one area in sure. particular that's no. seeing a big increase? So I'm not, I'm not really sure on that. I'd have to go back and look at the other years for those agencies. Just yeah, I would assume West Fargo, their population's gone up. I I'm sure theirs have gone up a little bit, but no, I didn't really run theirs. I can do that. I just didn't. I would just be curious if, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, or if it's cast count. Uh -oh. staff wasn't the best in the past of documenting all our calls for service. So we've been more diligent on making sure that people are getting credit for their work. That's one. Secondly, much like you said, we have some other parts of the county now that are increasing in population like the Horace, Horses, Castletons, where more people are moving out to those areas. So that's generating more calls for service. Um, and then we've been assisting more We've been assisting West Fargo and Fargo PD more because, like, especially like Fargo, every weekend we're going downtown um, now on Friday and Saturday nights and helping them downtown because they're extremely busy down there and they're having a hard time keeping up for calls for service. And so we've been sending a couple people down there on the weekend. So we've got, there's a number of different things that are attributed so, to it. So. so when you say that in the past you've been good about documenting it, doesn't the dispatch center just automatically document that? They, they do, but sometimes our guys generate their own work and then they don't okay. tell dispatch to start they a calls for service for them. stumble point. across something? Yeah, and they don't tell dispatch to start a calls for service mm -hmm. for them. So. Two, two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the calls for service there, have those been tracked the same way from 2018 to 21? Yep, so the, this all this data is pulled, it's all the same for everyone. So Fargo pulled up the calls for service data, they would get the same thing I have because it's all New World. We all use New World through dispatch. But, but there's not a difference reflected where, as, if I remember correctly, um, civil uh, warrant service yep. didn't previously go through triple RDC. Yep, they didn't go through RDC, so we have some additional stuff there. Mm -hmm. So that, and that's the documentation stuff that I was talking about. Okay, so that that's that change is reflected a little bit in those numbers. Yeah, and all that's all those different things, variables. Okay. So, but it's a pretty accurate reflection of what we're actually doing. Okay. Now I feel it's probably more precise, so. What, one other question, just with, you know, uh, taking downtown Fargo calls now, not mm -hmm. uh, previously doing that. Um, you're the sheriff, you make the call, but it, as thin as you, you are stretched where you are in the, in the, the open positions, what, was did you ever consider not um, taking on the, the downtown Fargo shifts? So that, that's a good question. Um, there's a couple things that we've, we've discussed uh, in relation to, to what you're bringing up, and that is that 
So we'll, we'll typically try to send two people down there if we have the staffing. If we're a little short, then we'll send one person down there. If, if we do send the two people down there and it starts getting busy out in the county, you know, we're really the only one that can answer our calls for service out in the county. So then we just tell Fargo, hey, listen, we're, we're getting busy out in the county. We gotta, we gotta pull back and go up there. Um, it hasn't happened too often where that's been an issue. Um, there's only really one time that I could think of where we had a fatality crash out on the interstate and we had to pull our resources from downtown. But it wasn't really busy that night, fortunately. Um, but typically it's just an adjustment of resources and how we divide up the districts. And it's really only from about, we're usually going down there about around one-ish, right Dean? Mm -hmm. to one till about 2.30, maybe sometimes a little bit earlier. So it's kind of a short time frame. This is really around that time when the bars are closing and kind of get towards the end of the night is when they're seeing the increased calls for service. So, and, and you know, I don't know if you guys have been downtown on a, on a night lately, uh, but the population oh. down there, <laughs> population down there is really, it's really jumped up. Um, I went, my wife and I went down there one night to have supper and I uh, couldn't believe the amount of people that were down there. And I think it's from the uh, increased apartments and stuff that are down there and everything. And getting assaults and a couple of shootings down there. So, yeah, there you go. Well, I have a question as far as, and this is other facets of Cass County working with you guys. Mm -hmm. Now, I've, I've heard where the coroner or the Fargo police chief said he's no longer going to have his police officers help the coroner carry out a, a dead person. You know, if you get a 500 pound guy that falls off the john and he's wedged in between something, he said, My officers are not going to carry him out. Mm. So, and where did you uh, see that? I didn't. Uh, I don't know. We heard. I heard it someplace. You where? know, that was one of her complaints. Is that, you know, Chris how Dupin. am I supposed to do it with three people? I. Oh yeah, I remember visiting with that. About that. So. And I don't know if that has anything to do with you, but there is sometimes if the police department wants the sheriff's department to help out with them. You know, scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Mm -hmm. There you go. I, I, I was just going to say, I, I think we've got a, uh, a, a number of, uh, of items with the coroner's office that, uh, you know, that she probably will bring to, to her rotational meeting and, and, and she's uh, raised, just so I have it on my, on my radar okay. screen that we need to probably have some, some reach outs with the city on. And, and I think... Uh, you know, we'll work uh, uh, work with the city and try to try to resolve these at maybe the lowest level possible. And I would just tell you that my, I mean, I think I had mentioned the, this to you guys before, but the, the downtown businesses they were um, they were frustrated with some of the you know the, the fact that we had limited space in the jail for some of the repeat customers down there, and I've gone to some of their. There are uh, bigger meetings downtown, and and they were they were frustrated with some of that, and so this was a way for us to do a lot of things. Um, number one, build good relations with Fargo PD, build good relations with the businesses downtown. Number three, just help with criminal problems because that's where we're getting some major issues down there. When you got people firing off weapons in high, you know highly populated areas, um, I feel like you know, yeah, we're we're gonna go down there and help you and try to get that stuff stopped. So, and I don't really look at my position as just service, serving the, you know, the outer county area. I'm the sheriff of the whole county. So, wherever we need help with criminal activity, that's where I feel like we, we would focus those efforts on. Okay. And then I just put up there some of our top, our 2021 top calls for service. I'm not going to go over each of those, but you can kind of look at the numbers. Um, we'll get into a little bit more of. I want to kind of spend more time for the jail here on the back end. So, um, crimes against persons. Our biggest crimes, or the majority of the calls that we take, are going to be um, property crimes like thefts, burglaries. That's uh, typically our higher calls for service. But as you guys know, we did have the two um, manslaughter and, and homicide charges that we had out in the county uh, two in Castleton and one in Horace. So, which was kind of unique over the last couple of years here. 
isolated, of course, between the individuals that were involved. You know, they weren't just random acts of violence, just people that knew each other and that type of thing. So, yes. So, I'm, I'm hearing a, a lot of chatter, internet chatter, about burglaries in Fargo mm -hmm. and break ins, and that, that the police really aren't doing anything. You're kind of on your own. I mean, maybe your doorbell camera picks it up and they'll take a report, but, you know, nobody's. Nobody's getting catching these guys. This is this is the chatter I'm hearing, and I realize you don't have anything to do with that. But I'm just wondering, how is it looking out in the county? Are you able? Are you staffed enough to be able to try to do some investigation? In, or maybe you don't have any burglaries out there. So we we do have burglaries. The majority of our burglaries that happen out in the county are people going to what they think is an abandoned farmstead and stealing scrap metal. And then they turn around and sell that scrap metal to purchase narcotics and things of that nature. That's a majority of ours. Um, most recently, you now we've been dealing with some bar break-ins again. We had one out at the Red Baron, where someone broke in and targeted the gaming machines out there. And then we just had one um, this past weekend down in Big Earth in Horace. Uh, there's been a number of them in Fargo. We are not sure at this point if they're related, but a number of bars in Fargo have been hit. So, um, that's the majority of the things that we see. People going, pulling up into someone's farmstead, knocking on the door, and if they answer, just asking them for directions or something. But if they don't answer, then burglarizing their their place, knowing that they're not home. Uh, it's not allowed. We don't have a lot of uh, forged pirate stuff happening out there. Um, typically, the burglaries and thefts that we get out in the county are usually one or two people doing a majority of them and eventually we figure out who's doing it and then stops for a while and someone else starts doing it. But for the majority of the time we figure out who's doing them and, and um, we we'll able to put cases together on them. So, yeah. So just some other calls for service on some of the stuff that we're dealing with. Um, Preserve burglaries and break ins and things like that. Oops. Narcotics offenses, weapon offenses. Mental health calls for service have um, increased. see on the bottom there they've, they've gone up I mean they were they were pretty high in 2018 um, in 19 uh, but they're still still fairly high 2019 of course was one of our higher years because of COVID and everything um, if we look at I mean if you look at that it actually looks like it's gone down a little bit but they're still our, one of our higher calls for service and so we've been working through um, trying to find some additional resources for our for our officers when they get on scene for mental health calls for service because one of those calls for service can cut type of deputy for a couple hours. You, you have know, access the, to the mobile crisis team? We do. We have access to the mobile crisis unit. Mobile and then just, just so this group knows, we've been meeting, uh, when I say we, it's been Fargo PD, West Fargo PD, Morin PD, Clay County, um, Sanford, Southeast Human Services, um, and we've been meeting quarterly to talk about how we can address some of these issues a little differently. Especially for us, if we get called to someone in age that's having a mental health crisis and we're not sure that it is a mental health crisis right away, it takes our guys a while to drive out there so you have some time that's going by right there on that calls for service. Now they get out there and they're trying to talk to this person to figure out what's going on with them. By the time they start figuring, hey, this is a mental, this is a mental health crisis, maybe something that we could use help when dealing with. Now they call the mobile crisis team out. Now they have to drive all the way out. You can type the deputy for two to three hours on one call. So we were talking about ways where we can potentially dispatch the mobile crisis unit almost immediately after we get dispatched. And then if we need to, we would just cancel them to try to cut down on some of those response times and times that we're out on the calls for service. So we kind of, we're just kind of starting to utilize that a little bit. Um, we're in 
attend to death totals there of the county. Do you ever use that mobile crisis thing, you know, just over the phone? We can. We can refer people to it over the phone. But I mean, if they were in a situation and you're out in page, and, you know, rather than having somebody drive all the way in from Fargo, if you need somebody right now, can you? Can they talk to someone over the phone, man? Yeah. Well, so we're always going to use 211. We're going to call 211 and try to hook them up with services. It kind of really depends on what the crisis is. So. All right, so we kind of talked about the patrol and the main thing uh, revolving patrol right now, or um, revolving patrol, I should say, is hiring from the outside. So we started doing that. We actually have um, two people from Fargo PD and one person from Valley City PD that applied with us right now. I'm meeting with them tomorrow afternoon, and uh, their, their files have made it all the way up to my desk, which means that they have a conditional offer at this time. So we might actually draw two people from Fargo PD, which is kind of somewhat, has been somewhat rare in the past from us. From us. Um, typically that pays a little higher, so these individuals are interested in coming and working for us right now. So, so um, that's, that's some kind of new trends that we're seeing. Um, and then I kind of already mentioned this a little bit ago, but uh, with us being down on patrol, we uh, currently have someone on the Fugitive Task Force, but we've taken that person from our Civil and Warrants Division, so that's dropped them down a person. And then we currently do not have anyone on street crimes right now because of being short staffed. So we're trying to get, like I said, our numbers back up so we can get someone on street crimes. Uh, we just don't have the staffing to do that. Um, and then uh, have SWAT on there because of Possibly in the future, we, we may need to look to. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner Bradley. Sorry. I was wondering, has there been any effort to determine whether or not these um, applicants from Fargo or Valley City have been passed over in, in the promotion process in their respective towns? At their agencies? Yeah. I, we don't, I don't know that specifically about these three. Um, can tell you that one of the persons wants to come to us because they're getting burned out from all the calls from service from that they're taking in Fargo and some dynamics on this particular shift that they're working there, some personnel issues. Um, Sheriff, if I can add yeah. this real quick too, some of their, their time frame that their agencies, you know, are that 18 month to, to 24 months. So <clears throat> I don't know that they necessarily had an opportunity uh, for advancement, whether it be at Valley City uh, or Fargo Police, so. Um, Is that something you can inquire about? Yeah, we, we can find out. Yeah. We can ask them. And that would have been passed along uh, a lot of the personnel records, so. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's more of they want an agency change. change. Um, and like the work maybe that our office is involved in, you know, we're, more, we're generating work, we're getting out and probably because we have a little bit less call volume, we're getting out in the communities and visiting with people more and working more, um, building relationships because we have time to do that. Whereas where Fargo officers are kind of running from call to call to call. So, Robert, do you have a question? I, I, I know you said earlier that the morale impact is there uh, for uh, CEOs of hiring out. I mean, do you have a sense? Can you quantify? Is that? I mean, are you gonna are, are you gonna lose four by gaining three? Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. Um, Andy, do you have a better perspective? I, I don't get that sense. I mean, I think if anything, the vast majority of the feedback I've got from the jail is almost a sense of relief. Those that want the job, obviously, there's some disappointment, but they completely understand the position that we're in. Okay. I think we run the risk of the exact opposite. If we were to say, yep, we're pulling four more out because that's how we do it, we might risk losing eight or 10 that don't want to pick up the slack from that yeah, one because they're, they're already at, operating well beyond what could be reasonably they're, expected. They're working so much now, I think we would lose more people that way. Because keep in mind, there's only a certain amount of people that can come out because they have the person has to be licensed um, before they can come out on patrol. Not all the licensed staff in the jail wants to come out on patrol. Okay. So we're probably talking like what, maybe six, seven, eight people. Uh, I, don't, I don't imagine it's even eight that we have fully qualified. Sure. Right now, so. Is this 
is the best bad option that we've got. Sure, no, that, that makes sense. It's a fine balance of providing public safety, making sure that we have enough people out on the street, keeping the jail happy, keeping the staffing levels up in there, and then maybe taking a person out here and there to keep everyone so they want to stay there. I mean, it's a balancing in many different angles or ways. So, um, I have SWAT on there because, as most of you probably know right now, we have three people on our SWAT team on the tactical side. I don't know what's going to play out with the, the Minnesota use of force stuff, but we don't always have a contingency plan in place, but let's say that they don't change that and it stays the way that it is. Over time, if that happens, I'm guessing that Moorhead and Clay County will pull, would pull their people off the SWAT team, which would cause us to be short on this side by seven people. And so between Fargo, West Fargo, and us, we're going to have to figure out how to replace those seven spots so we have enough on call-ups. And I can probably tell you that Fargo is probably not going to add many more people. If they do, maybe one, because they've already got 13 people on the team. They've got the most on there. They're going to probably look to us in West Fargo and say, hey, we need you to can you pony up some more people here. We've already got 13 people on there. So I just bring that to your attention because I don't know when that would happen. Of course, the costs that we would accrue through that would be some extra additional overtime costs, maybe some equip initial equipment costs to get those operators outfitted. And then it would just be a matter of some on-call pay and overtime. So where, where that, is that? Where is that court case or that it's, that effort to resolve that? that spoke, they had 90 days, I think it was, from the closing arguments to render an opinion. And so I think that brought us to the middle of January. Okay. So hopefully by then we would know. I mean, of course, we hope that it changes and they can stay on the team. But they, I mean, just contingency planning here. I just want to give you guys a little bit of a heads up in case they could come back later on down the line and say, hey, we got to have two or three people onto the team. The, the attitude that I saw from elected leaders at that last meeting we had mm -hmm. um, didn't bode well for any kind of, yeah. you know, regardless of a court case. I, I, I just think Minnesota has a different attitude. And it was kind it of. It might not be something we can work together with. Yeah, and I mean, no. I'm sure Sherling was talking about some rep representatives, I think, specifically. Not having the mayor is great to work with over there. Um, and then obviously the law enforcement leaders are great to work with over there. And they wanted to work out. So. But yeah, just really, really felt strongly that Minnesota's plan was the plan to go with. And too bad, so sad for Cass and Clay County. Yep. All right, so um, there's uh, warrants, just kind of give you some number of comparison on warrants that we're taking in in, in civil process papers. Court transport, I uh, just wanted to, I'm going to pass these around to you guys. I had um, Lieutenant Fuller print these out for us. You know, on a day-to-day -day basis, when people come in and out of the courthouse, they <clears throat> see our staff up at the front there at the security stations, and there's a number of people that pass through those points. And I just I want to send some of the stuff around just to show you what our guys are, guys and gals are pulling off people when they go through those security stations. I mean, very attentive, attentive to detail, pulling off little razors like that on keychains, razor blades, and um, even drugs that. People are trying to get into the facility. Let's pass these around. You guys can look at them. That's right out here. Out here over at the annex, yep. And that's just since that's, I came over. That's just since she came over here, which is only been a couple months. So I just, I, I've always thought maybe you guys would be interested to see what people try to get through those security points and the amount of stuff that would be coming in here. So go ahead and send them around. And, um, Taylor, don't scrap those and keep moving. And again, I, when we get some of that stuff, I certainly send a message out to our staff because some of the things they're finding, you'll, you'll see a lipstick in there that when you take the top off, it's a razor blade. So the stuff that they're finding when they are looking through stuff. 
Okay, then jumping into our personal and property crimes, I just was going to show up there that we, um, so far this year, 618 total investigations. I know when I showed this slide out at the township meeting, I had a few people come up to me afterwards and they said, was, was that literally investigations out in the county? And yeah, majority of those 618 are just out in the county. So. Yeah. That one guy wanted to know, he was a constable. Yep. Can he still make he was, civilian arrests? Yep, he was asking about that. So here's some stuff, I, here's some stats that I pulled from the Cass County Drug Task Force, which we have a representation on, and that was from today, so you can kind of see some of the stuff that they seized um, throughout this year. Uh, if you see at the top there, those M30 pills, that's something that we're really seeing right now in our area. And those are pills laced with fentanyl. Um, that's some of the stuff that, you know, that's been causing some of the overdose deaths. There's a, here's a picture of a recent drug seizure that just happened over the last couple weeks that our Cass County Drug Task Force was involved in. Um, so this was a really good uh, seizure and basically it was done in, in accordance with a task force officer out of the cities who tipped our staff off that there might be a quantity of approximately 15 pounds of meth in the Fargo area. And so our guys doing some, some research based off the information that was given from that task force officer. They were able to pinpoint the suspects down to a local hotel here in town and through the use of a, of a canine and doing some different investigative techniques, they were able to get a search warrant and get into that hotel room and that's what they found in there, 9.3 pounds of, of meth. So, um, you know, we're still getting some large quantities like this coming into our area. I think for the most part, you guys know um, kind of how the drug distribution works in this area. A lot of the stuff that we get comes out of Chicago. It'll come up from Chicago into the cities and then from the cities over into our area. And the reason that that happens is because they can sell drugs in the Fargo Moorhead area for a lot more money than they can sell it for in the cities in Chicago because there's not as much of it here. So when they traffic it into this area, they can double their prices and they know the money they make. Um, and so that's, that's what they do. All right, and we'll get into the jail stuff here because um, I really want to spend some time on that. Um, And ended up being there was nowhere to load any sort of ammunition. And she said it was actually like one of those little fidget things, but it was we, we fidget took it. thing. Yeah, oh, it's like Don Knotts. I, mean. <laughs> I know. Yeah, but, so. but I mean, if you you know, so here's the thing. Here's why that's relevant. Even if it wasn't able to fire anything, if that that is even that big right there, and someone pulls that out while they're in the courthouse, and our staff sees that they could respond to them by using force against them sure. and up to deadly force, depending on what that person's doing with that. So if that's not caught at the security station, that could cause a lockdown in here, could cause a use of force issue. And so that's why that's super important. That's why I showed it, even though it's not able to be fired, because to the human eye, you're not going to know that. Oh, yeah. So if you see it, so. She got a little squirrely and just left. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't a firearm, but she just left with it. So we, we, Scott Morton, he took it upon himself to dive and look into it and see what it is, and that's nothing to be concerned but obviously recognizing it. <laughs> that's what I mentioned for sure. So. so one thing that if you guys probably have seen, if you, if you came in through the east door or the door over at the annex lately, because we have signs out there now, and um, Lieutenant Fuller worked together with our, our court staff and the state's attorney's office to put up those signs, and so now it says that anyone coming into the facility is subject to search upon entering the premises. And the reason that we put those signs up there is so that people understand, it gives them an opportunity, as weird as it sounds, if someone comes through those doors and it may not be clear to them that we're gonna search them, we could potentially end up into a situation where the items that we seize from them could be taken. 
who could be violating their rights and taking it, right? So we have to follow, obviously, the Fourth Amendment search and seizure. And so in order to prosecute people and do things properly, we have to have a properly sign out there. So that's why you will now see signs out there clearly telling everyone that once you go beyond this point, you're subject to search. That gives them the opportunity that if they don't want to come in here with their illegal items, they can turn around at that point and leave. But once they come through there and get searched, then it's a different story. So is there any good reason that Clay County doesn't let you come in with a phone? They probably let you in, but they don't let me in unless I call ahead to a commissioner to say I'm coming in, I want to bring my phone. But <laughs> Probably done yeah. for a couple of reasons. I mean, I, I haven't talked to them specifically, but maybe it's done for, they're worried about someone taking photos of the inside of the building for um, security purposes. They've done um, this for years. I mean, 20 yeah. years that I know of. You can't bring a phone up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure, but I would say, <laughs> I would say it would probably be for security reasons, uh, that it could potentially be some sort of a explosive device, I suppose. Um, maybe they're not allowed in the courtrooms if people are bringing in, they're having issues with that. So they decided just to handle it at the front doors. I don't know. So. Okay. All right, so jumping into the jail, currently we have 17 people or participants on our community supervision unit. Um, everyone knows what that is? Community supervision? Okay, community supervision unit is a unit that we have where um, based on a person's current charges and their bond and things like that, they can get out on this, on this supervision unit and then they can continue to go to services every day if they're addiction services or what other types of services that they're on and then I have two staff that are assigned to just follow through and make sure that they're going to their services and that they're complying with, with their sentences and stuff like that. So that gives us a little bit of extra room in the jail. And then, we, of course, we have 240 people on 24-7, so quite a few on that. What's your failure rate on 24-7 checks? No, Andy? Is Chad here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chad, Chad is our person that oversees that. He would be able to tell you specifically. Yeah. The, the rate of uh, failure and absconding, I can say, is, is about 25% of what it is for people that just post bond and then don't show up to court. It's very, very low. There's an extensive screening process that goes into it, and they're automatically disqualified to pay up history of, of not showing up in the past. It's only for very low level, you know, no serious offenses or crimes against people. Um, and they're all accountable. Um, I mean, there are there are some of them. I'd say this year maybe it's like probably less, you know, four or five people for the whole year so far that have and they and they may have responded from that. There. Okay, the next slide that I have up there is um, it goes to it just shows you kind of um, what we've it's accepted and denial as you see up there, and those are the amount of people that we've accepted into the jail and the amount that we've denied. Um, individuals that have misdemeanor type charges who are not necessarily a public safety risk um, and the jail is full at the time so then what happens is is that officer will call the jail and ask if we have room um, they'll say hey we just stopped this person that they were charged with the DUS um, or they're being charged with driving under suspension and we're wondering if we can bring them to the jail they might not have any other charges. And we have a form that the jail has where we ask specific questions of the officers to determine kind of the risk level of not bringing them in, okay? Uh, we started doing this with COVID and then when we got COVID and needing that room for isolation and stuff. So you look at that, we've accepted 70 where the officers called and asked them and said, yeah, bring them in. Um, and that was through March, March 21st through um, June 21st, <clears throat> and we denied 138 people. So that was 138 people that we said, no, you can't bring them here. Okay, that's gotten a little bit less now because we're accepting more people. Um, if you look underneath, where we've had 75 people accepted and now 69 denied. Um, but that, of course, pushes us every day to where we're kind of at our capacity. So 
and this will, this will lead us into what Andy's going to talk about here in a few months. So when we talk about people coming in and isolating and why does that cause so much um, space issues in the jail, is because when the jail was built, it wasn't really, we never really thought about at the time when it was being built that we'd have a pandemic and we'd have to single cell people because they need to be isolated. So a lot of, a number of the cells in the jail have two bunks in them, right? And they're for two inmates. Well, if we have someone come in and they have to be isolated for either a mental health issue, they can't be doubled up with someone because maybe they're on suicide watch or something, or because of um, COVID, that one person being in that cell ties up two beds. And so it really cuts into our capacity that we have available to us. Okay, um, does that make sense to everyone? So, um, I was obviously, as I've talked with you guys before, I, I'm not really, I realize that it is what it is based on what we have available to us. I'm not really comfortable denying people at all. I'd like that number to be zero, but I know that's not reality right now. Um, I, I personally feel that if people are out causing issues and victimizing other people, they, sh they should get their stuff taken care of, come to jail and get it taken care of, no matter if that means that they go get services, that they pay restitution, that they complete a jail sentence to, to face their charges. Um, that's, in my opinion, I feel that needs to happen. But we're not able to do that right now, okay? Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to take this off here if I can. How would I switch to yours, Andy? I'm gonna minimize your PowerPoint first. About about how many beds? Because of the single capacity rather than double, are we looking at? So we have a total of approximately 60 beds available to us for, for new intake arrivals um, until they can clear through the whole medical, get a, get a negative, negative COVID test to get them into the general population safely. Um, that's the hard point, but I wanted to, I thought you wanted me to go through the staff sheet that I gave you. I'll just, I'll just talk about it. So just, just to give you a picture of what it looks like today. So of those 60 beds that we have, 34 people are showing no, or that are filled right now. 34 showing no symptoms, but we're still awaiting test results. Four that have COVID symptoms, but we're still awaiting test results. Nine that are still awaiting their initial medical evaluation, probably that came in either last night or today. Five that are fully quarantined. Um, to be fully quarantined, you either have to have had a positive COVID test or refusing to submit to the process. Um, so that comes to 43, 47, that's 52 out of the 60 beds. So we have eight beds remaining for a combination of men and women. For the rest of the day today. So that's why Fargo and West Fargo has to call us because we have to prioritize who's coming in. So their officers will literally call and say, can I bring this person in now at this point? Because we only have eight beds available for the day. So of, of those numbers that the sheriff's showing when they call ahead, just keep in mind too, that there are six criteria that they don't have to call. We'll take them no matter what. Those are things like any felony arrest, any probation, any parole violation, those types of things. There's six different categories. Misdemeanors where the person is, person's current conduct um, is showing, is actively disruptive or, um, public safety risk, uh, people that have misdemeanor charges where they've dealt with them more than once in the same 24 hour period, that sort of thing. So on those, anybody that fits those criteria, they don't even have to call, they just bring them. So what we want to do is make sure we have a minimally, minimal number of beds available for both men and women in any given time so that if they come across those, they can just bring them. We don't want to fill up all 60 because then our only remaining option is to put people directly into that general population. So, and then on top of that, <coughs> We're getting more positives right yeah. now. So just to talk about a little bit of those stats a little bit. Um, we have had, for the year to date since January 1st, a total of 503 inmates that we've had to quarantine. When remember quarantine is either diagnosed with COVID or they're refusing the process. Um, 222 of those were actually related to quarantine prior to transport to DOCR, which left us with 281 for the year. Um, of those, 
92 of those 281 have come since October 1st. So that's about 33% of total people that we've quarantined have been just in the last two months, or two and a half months. So, and then just real quick, if we don't show that we're being diligent on the front end and quarantining and testing and everything, then guess what happens when we have people that want to go out to the pen? And won't take them because they're like, well, how do we know that they're not positive? We're not going to take them. So if we show the, that we're doing these processes on the front end, which we would want to do anyway, so we don't have to break out in our pod, but it helps us on the back end to try to get people out too to get give us more than one back end. So, so what, what's the plan going forward here? Because, I mean, everything I'm, I'm hearing is that cases are increasing and it's, that this next wave is really going to hit hard and it's probably going to hit fast. And I think you guys have been doing an excellent job of having this slow burn in, in the jail and confining it. But what happens if it starts really moving through? Um, can, can you double bunk your COVID people? I mean, how, what are you going to do? Yep. The cells that we have available designated for isolation are not double bunk cells. Those are down in the general pop, and those are, I mean, I have, I have five total bunks available in those cells right now as it is. And after that, it's a dormitory. Um, if we have any kind of outbreak or a huge increase in number of cases, that gives us somewhat more flexibility in cohorting sick people together. Um, we're not, you know, the, the total number that we're concerned about right now is, is less than 10. Um, but just out of safety, we don't want to find somebody who's symptomatic or had it, move them down, and all of a sudden I do have, you know, inadvertently infected 47 other people. Right. Um, if we do have, if we do get to the point where we experience that, that would be almost make things easier to be able to group people in those larger groups together better. Um, but I certainly can't intentionally create that situation. Right. To, so and I didn't mean to call them patients. Yeah. I well, they, I mean, they are at that point. We need to, we need to care for them as patients, just the same yeah. way as inside. If you look at so, the bills submitted by the public health on a monthly basis, they are patients. Yeah. Because so those are fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a month for for the care. Yeah, can be up to that. But on average, it's twelve, isn't it? Well, we're paying um, we're paying about six thousand. <coughs> we pay six thousand dollars a month for our in-house doctor care. That's just our our flat rate we for the doctor to come out just in general. And we're seeing anywhere from three thousand to eight thousand dollars a month in, in outside services for hospitals and clinics and things like that. So the a couple things that is kind of a result of not always having space in there are things like, this hasn't really happened lately, but for example, West Fargo rested someone once and they wanted the person to come to jail and didn't really meet the criteria and we were full. So they drove to the jail and told them, oh, can't really take that person, which led to a slam on the door and leaving pissed off at our staff. Um, I got a call from the Fargo chief last week and said, hey, when can we start bringing people in here? Because right now it's just people they're coming into contact with. They're not actively going out and arresting people on their city warrants either because they don't have the space. So um, what Andy's going to talk about here is when, this, when the jail was built, no one thought of a pandemic, right? So and we had brought up to you guys, or I brought up to you a few times that we're looking to potentially expand the jail. So I want everyone to kind of under, understand that our thought process is that we're not just looking to expand or asking to expand the jail just to expand it. We realize that in, when we look to expand it, or if we do, that there's certain ways that we would want to do that so that we can accommodate future pandemics, future problems that we would have, um, future mental health health problems we would have to better utilize the space that we currently have um, to, to house more individuals. Okay, so he's going to show you kind of what our idea is and with that. Um, actually, some of the photos he's going to pull up are from Burley County. So. I have to share this correctly first. Give me just a second.
Although Andy's getting that ready, mm -hmm. uh, so everybody's aware. Jesse made us aware because because they've had to turn away a lot of these prisoners and kind of ticking off West Fargo and Fargo Police Department. We can probably be looking at a news article coming out at some point in time or TV deal wondering why is Cass County turning away prisoners? Well, I've, it's because of, and I'll, I'll let him explain it, but because we're, we're at capacity. I've talked to the media a few times because they've called and inquired about it. Um, and just kind of let them know what we're doing. So I don't know if they, I don't know if anyone, like you said, <clears throat> someone will run with the bigger story at some point. But at this point, I've been able to answer their questions and concerns to this point. But okay, um, I had the opportunity to tour what Burley County built. Um, they've been operational now for about four years. Um, this picture right here is is within their new facility, and this is very similar to what some of our single bunking looks like right now. Um, you'll notice that the staircase is within the unit there, which is, which is a type of, of building that creates an additional difficulty for us with all of our mental health cases and all the people that are at risk of, of suicide and jumping off and we have to protect them from themselves. But this is very much like what some of our, our single bunk housing looks like right now. Um, so when I meet with the consultant that you contracted with, um, on a bigger scale than this, so this is only one housing unit, um, this sort of housing, if, if you can see the photograph there, um, you'll notice it's isolated, but it's also the stairs are on the outside where the inmates don't have access to it. And they're cohorted in groups of smaller groups of say eight to ten cells like that. Um, which is a very would be a very good design for us to choose to go with in any kind of expansion. Because so this is the area that Andy's talking about. So obviously the cells are behind the glass here, and then there's this walkway on the outside. Um, see that. Yeah. And then the, the staff desk is isolated and, and one staff can observe. So if, if we were to think of something on the end of the jail where we have two full housing units right now, a footprint design like this where the cells go around the perimeter with visibility from the outside, grouping them where they don't have access, everything could be treated as a first floor cell. We could group people by by condition when we cohort them. You know, if we have groups of eight or sixteen people, let's say that all need methadone, we could house them together with and added things like treatment or mental health care um, with similarly situated individuals while still keeping them safe and still um, have better access for, for more single isolation space as well. And then each of those separate sections can be utilized differently on a day-to-day -day basis depending on the needs. Um, instead of one section of 48, 48 inmates um, not being able to take somebody COVID positive into that unit, now, if we had just eight, we could dedicate eight of them for COVID positive. If we have 32, we could dedicate four of those units for COVID positive housing. So I just wanted to bring these along. This is something we're going to show the consultant as they start looking at potential design features. Um, what about the Clay County Jail? They have anything like that? So Clay County has built their jail. I haven't. I don't have any photographs, and I haven't been over there to see it myself. But they did design so that they can have housing units that are dedicated for certain categories or types of inmates rather than by classification. Um, Behavior-wise, it's more by condition that the, a criteria that the inmate meets that they can separate them in that way. Um, so they can have like a dedicated housing unit for mental health care and have mm -hmm. you know dedicated nurses and things like that to, to focus on that. So, and again, when we talk about potentially expanding, we talk about, okay, we're going to need a lot more staff, right, to do that. Well, based on how this is set up, that might that will help limit that because a person down here can see and do all this area. We still have to have additional workers at the jail, used to be fights and stuff, but not as many people to probably observe all that based on how it's set up. So we have the officer station there with a couple of people that can watch all the different corrections. So and they're safer because they're observing, you know, when, when they when the inmates are out in a day area like it would be now in ours, they're behind this glass. So we can still see them and the officer isn't directly involved with them. So. Can you do any remodeling of what we have? Um, yeah, that's, I don't know, I'm not sure. It's I'm sure about the, the, the consultant could look at that, but the, the issue we would have with any kind of remodel is you've got to shut down and reduce, you know, we've got to lose access to 48 beds during any type of remodel that would happen while that construction goes on. So we can certainly look at 
what options there might be for that kind of thing. Um, we also want to keep in mind, though, that, that this type of housing isn't, you know, it's, it's more for inmates that would have what we, what we term special needs, um, which we're seeing an increase in, but we still have a significant portion of the, if we bring, you know, go back to a full capacity with no COVID restrictions, we still have, you know, 80, 85% of the prison or of the jail that doesn't cause us any concerns other than we just got to keep them inside the jail. And then this is, you know, overkill for that kind of thing. Um, because they can live in the, the larger groups of up to 48 with no, with no immediate concerns outside of our general population housing. So I guess the, the whole idea that you guys more to show any, this is the last slide. I just wanted to, so I guess the whole idea is I just wanted you guys to know, because like I said, we brought this up a couple times while looking to potentially expand the jail. I, I just wanted you, you guys to know that we were thinking of ways how you know, what are the problems that we're currently facing now and how could we work through those issues by designing the jail, the addition differently? You know, again, our, one of our biggest problems right now is that when the current jail is built, we didn't think of the pandemic, so it wasn't really set up to work through a pandemic. But designing something like this going forward would give us, always give us that capability in the future, which I think is what we would want, right? Or thinking how we work through situations in the future. Um, and like Andy said, of being able to isolate people based on maybe behavioral concerns, mental health issues, methadone stuff that he mentioned, isolation for diseases, uh, things of that nature. So. Andy, Andy uh, the Burley County Jail, does that also accommodate Morton County? Yeah, they're, they're adjoining. Between the two counties. And how many total do you, beds are there, or rooms are, or whatever you want to call them, units? I haven't seen a breakdown. I mean, they combine them both, and they're not designated units just for Morton County. They're all, you know, at the same same time. So I, I have no idea what the ratio is. I would guess it's probably at most 10% Morton County, 90%. Yeah, he's wondering what the total capacity is. For the whole jail? Yeah. Oh, it's 545, I think, is the way they, they built it to hold up to that. I mean, they, so that's not all that they have. I mean, we've got several different styles of units. That's just one section that yeah. they built. It's about 200 more than ours. Yeah, that's really the comparison I wanted to make. Yeah, sorry. I misunderstood. I think it's 545 is their absolute capacity if they're fully open. I think they still have a dormitory, if I'm not mistaken, that holds up to 100 people that they haven't opened yet because of staffing issues. But they don't have a need. All right, that was, uh, that's the materials that I wanted to present to you guys. What questions do you have for us or for me right now? Anything. It's a quick question. So we've talked about jail expansion on and off for the last two years. Are we close to a plan? Do we have a timeline? What? I'm curious where we're at. Well, the, the consultant that was contracted is going to do a study to tell us what they think our needs are. I mean, he's coming in on later this week to have the first discussion with me so I can lay out data and stuff that we have and then any other requests that they have for to consider that. I don't know what time frame you gave him for when his report is due. Um, I would... Uh, um, I, this is Klein McCarthy. I'm, I'm uh, assuming that's Scott Fettig, uh, the principal architect uh, there that has worked on the intake expansion. And we put out the RFP a um, month or so ago that closed um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there, were, there was only one submittal, uh, and that was Klein, Klein McCarthy. Uh, I've reached out to them for a draft contract uh, have not received that at that uh, at this point. Once we get it, we'll run that through state's attorney's office. Uh, once it's been been vetted, uh, that will come before the board for for consideration. That includes both the architectural services as well as an inmate population forecast. Um, off the top of my head, I think that proposal was a turnaround time front to back of about four months. Um, and then at that point, you would have a projection of what um, the inmate population would look like um, 
10, 15 years uh, into the future, as well as a, a recommendation for uh, design uh, process moving forward, as well as a uh, draft budget, uh, estimated budget, of what that expense would be. So that the, the next step will be uh, actual get a contract uh, draft draft agreement from uh, from them that we'll bring forward for your consideration to formalize this work and move forward with it. I didn't realize that they were um, uh, already uh, engaging with you. They clearly are fairly confident that uh, uh, that, that we're going to make that uh, uh, get that that proposal and something we can uh, can agree on and, and move forward with. He called me. He said he's, yeah, going, to, he's going to be in. He said he's going to be in town, and he just wanted to have an yeah. initial meeting. So. No, I didn't mean to. So, uh, we can cancel if we need to. <laughs> you did a good job of just you know describing the process, A to B. So let's just say from the time if this, the project gets approved design wise, two years, two and a half years. I think it'll, it'll probably take three. You have to get full plans, approval, budget, and then start. So we're uh, we realistically four years out. If we start now. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I just want people to understand where we're at. I mean, get behind that in my opinion, but that's me. And where's the <laughs> revenue for? Well, I, I think what what we have what we've talked about and, and what we've uh, pretty extensively researched on from my office and and. Uh, uh, is that you know their ARPA funds includes um, authorizations for um, reaction to and planning for uh, public health crises, pandemic, and mitigation efforts to uh, uh, alleviate that. And and uh, you know in in all of the folks that we have access to and reference. From at the at the NACO level, at the state association level, uh, we have um, um, consulted with and and uh, feel confident that we can use that. Uh, that's a, a legitimate use of funds. What's the expenditure date? Final date for expenditure of ARPA funds? Twenty four, twenty five. I I think uh, allocation by twenty twenty four. Uh, actual expenditure by end of twenty six. Twenty six. You got four years. Yeah. So that means we got to really start like pronto. Well, that's, that was my point. And then the other piece is, you know, I we're talking a pretty substantial expansion, and I have no idea well, how many times we allocated the same group of ARPA funds, different projects yet. And what what what's the project like this cost? And off the cuff. Well, it depends on wholly on. On what he comes back with a recommendation for. I mean, obviously, the hundred minimum cost. You, you be, I, I haven't heard any any feedback from him yet as, as what the current going rate per square foot is, or you know what type of housing you build is going to depend on that too. So I, I can tell you that for their entire facility, the whole 540 40 people built four years ago was 60 million. So if we're talking about a fifth of that, we're not going to have. We already have all of the. All the HVAC infrastructure, all that. There, we're just talking about you know walls and toilets and doors. So, you know, it could be thirty million. It could be fifteen or twenty, I suppose. I was going to say twenty. But that's that. That's where my need, estimate would be. You needed added HVAC. <laughs> you no, know, I'm just saying. You know, the infrastructure. We don't have to build a whole kitchen. We don't have to build a whole medical office and yeah. Yeah, take care of all that. We have uh, through this intake expansion process. There are a couple of points that needed a little bigger, be it air handler or chiller or a, a piece of uh, building infrastructure, and, and those have been sized recognizing a, uh, future growth. So where, where if you were doing this from square one, you'd have this many pieces of building infrastructure that, that also need to be in, uh, increased, we've probably, Accomplished seventy or eighty percent of those through the jail intake expansion. Well, and then we've got our dispatch center. Yes. You know, I, I just I don't want any of this to fall on the backs of property owners. Well, yeah. 
it's good. Sales tax. It's a good idea, but I'm just thinking, you know, 35 million today, given the rate of inflation, isn't going to buy 35 million, mm -hmm. you know, in a contract. It's just, it's just not going to be come close to that. So I, I don't know what, you know, I. So I think it will be some type of a bond issue or a tax issue or something. I just don't know how you're going to get past it. Because we've got other, other ways to spend $35 million as well. If I'm not mistaken, unless we've got earmarked on the entire arc of funds for jail expansion. I don't know. I haven't heard that part, but I'm just curious. From, for, from my, my, my point, we've heard a lot of, uh, we, we've heard a number of external uh, requests or ideas of how you may want to spend ARPA funds. Uh, my, uh, my, my feedback and what I've tried to, to share with you in, uh, in different conversations is that the, the core needs that I'm hearing about are jail expansion and triple RDC. And I, I think that's, if it's not all, that's going to be a, that's going to be a large majority of those funds. And, and so, uh, holding off on other projects until we have really well-defined budgets for these two would, would certainly be my recommendation. Now, I, now, I think these are needs. We've gotten a list of wishes wants, correct. And wants and, you know, and they're all lovely ideas, but, you know. I, I will say it is, it is a, a good positive for us that, that the, the winning bidder for this consultant is also an architect, and he's also worked on several of these projects in the past, so we should get a really, really good close approximation um, in today's dollars once they're done, you know, if it's March or April when he's done with it, of, you know, he's gonna certainly be able to take into account area growth, you know, related to the completion of the diversion and all those types of things. So we should get a, a really solid number look at say, what is it gonna cost and what are the actual anticipated. And local cost market may be inflated with diversion authority. Work. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I think too that the design phase should be lessened, like that Burley County deal. Our people like that design and want something. They can they can use design phases from other jails that have already been put up to incorporate into what what you want. That will lessen the design phase up considerably. They can take. They borrow and steal from other designs that can incorporate into this one. Is there anything else? We're going a little bit over time. If not, adjourn this meeting. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Very informative.